Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you guys. Um, if this is your first time here at Hill City, my name is John Wagler. I'm part of this, this team here and just really grateful uh, you decided to spend a portion of your Sunday here. Um, if you're looking for a church home, uh, we really hope and pray uh, that we become that place for you and just love that you are here. We're in the last week of this uh, sermon series called Copy and Paste where we're taking a look at uh, what does it mean to actually image God? What does that actually look like? And what does it mean to represent, uh, be a representative of his kingdom? And uh, to, have, to understand that as image bearers, like every person on the face of this planet has dignity and deserves uh, uh, honor and respect. And that our main purpose in life as an image bearer, which all of us are, uh, is to be a representative of God's kingdom and build his kingdom. So each week we've been kind of adding layers to our understanding of what that is. Uh, looking a lot at the creation story. Uh, but to close out the series today, this is actually, you know, our last Sunday for Lacey and I for, um, for going sabbatical. And, um, and so you're, you're going to just get the airing of the grievances for, um, no, we're not going to get that. But we're going to, when we're talking to uh, our consultants that uh, were helping us out with how do we like use the sabbatical time in the right way. And one of the things that they said was, hey, make sure you do like a brain dump on all the things. And so, uh, when I was thinking about this last week, I was like, all right, there's some things that I just want to get off my chest and uh, that uh, as a challenge for our community um, and to make sure that I say them uh, before we're gone for uh, a little bit and, um, and then whatever damage is done, everyone else can clean it up when we're gone. So, um, but here's what's just interesting. Um, how many... I like illusions. Does, do any of you guys, anyone else like illusions? Like, I like when, like, there are people who do illusions, and then, and also, like, when you see, like, pictures of illusions, I'm fascinated by them. I'm, it's, like, what it does in our brains and everything. And so, um, and here's one. Do, is it working right now? Yeah. Um, here's one. So, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this. It's like, how many legs does the elephant have, right? And when you look at the picture, your, your brain starts doing something uh, and it's tr tr the, the illusion itself tricks your brain into thinking that there's a lot of legs there, right? But if you put your finger and you cover up the feet, so if you, can just, if you do that, it becomes really clear and really easy that you just see the four legs, right? And so uh, these illusions, what ends up happening is uh, the way that they're designed to do is to essentially trick your brain into believing uh, something that isn't there. You know, it's, it's trying to trick your brain into uh, saying like, okay, I think I'm seeing this, and I'm, I, I think I see eight legs there, you know, or however many you see. But the truth is, is that there's something else there. And so when we take a step back for a second and look at what's happening throughout culture and throughout the church, um, I really believe that we are believing some illusions. So like we, it seems like um, there's a large grouping of Christians who believe that evil is winning, so we should live out of fear. That's an illusion. Uh, there's a large grouping of Christians who believe we should fight and win every cultural war possible, and then people will surrender their lives to Christ. That is an illusion. There are people who would say, like, if we can just show people how wrong they are, finally they'll think that Jesus is right. That is an illusion, right? Right? And so it's important to start processing this in the right way with these illusions. I was reading this article by uh, this guy, Russell Moore, and uh, he's been around for a long time, and he's a great thinker. And he was talking about how, uh, you know, it seems like Christians, one of the top questions Christians ask right now are, uh, who's trying to steal America from us? And that is the wrong question to be asking. It's an illusion to think about America in this, in this kind of manner that we think about it, but, but it's an illusion. Like, we're kind of set up to start thinking and believing the wrong things. The most important question you can ever ask, and I really mean this, the most important question you can ever ask that shapes your purpose, that shapes your hope, that shapes how you work, that shapes how you love, that shapes every part of your being, is this question right here. Who do you say Jesus is? That's it. It's the most important question for your entire life. I know we'll ask ourselves a lot of other questions, and I know we'll, we'll think um, a lot of other things deeply matter, and I'm not saying that they don't matter, but the most important thing for your life is the answer to this question. 
Because how you answer this question will be how you live your life. So if you treat Jesus as just an add-on to your life, or just kind of casually talk, you know, casually engage him and everything, then guess what? Jesus actually isn't a part of your life. And you'll live your life for yourself. But if you say that Jesus is Lord, or that Jesus is Messiah, or Jesus is Christ, um, or Jesus saves, then that means that you are about the kingdom of Jesus. So in order to, to, to have that as a reality, so if you've ever uttered these words, I'm a Christian, then at the core part of who you are has got to be Jesus. It just has to be. You can't get around it. You can't get around it in the Bible. You can't. Now, I know that kind of culturally, we've shaped this idea that you can casually engage Jesus and it'd be okay. But that's actually not, we don't ever see that in the Bible, not once. And so we begin to start thinking through, like, the answer to this question is what shapes everything. So in these cultural conversations and these things that are happening that are very important, like, uh, with, like, stuff like racism, it's like, you know, even what happened with the last shooting, it's like, are these conversations important? Yes, very much so. Are these conversations important about how we engage racism as Christians? Very much so. Should we be involved in those conversations? Absolutely, Yes. But man, when it comes to, to race and to sexuality and to money and to marriage and to dating and to work, um, all these huge cultural conversations that are happening around us, if Jesus isn't at the center of the conversation, guess what you don't get in the conversation? Jesus. If Jesus isn't there in the conversation, then guess what won't happen? Your life, your conversation, your actions, your thoughts will not model Jesus. They will not be about his kingdom. You will not be imaging God in those moments. And so whatever the conversation is that seems to be so divisive right now, and there are plenty of them that go around, or whatever that thing is in your life that um, is taking away, like maybe, like maybe you work all the time. Maybe you're like, I mean, I'm putting in 70 hours a week, but yet you see your marriage crumble, or you see your, your parenting crumble, or you see your relationships, your friendships crumble, whatever. And it's like, okay, well, if Jesus isn't at the center of your life, then you're imaging something else. And you will not get the freedom, the life, and the peace that God has for you. And you're going to get the hell that comes with it. And so these are, this is what happens. And so this question is the most important question you can answer. This question will shape everything about your life. And when you start thinking about this and in terms of how we answer this question, I think our inability to see... Um, how important it is to keep Jesus at the center of these conversations is causing so many problems within the church. You know, uh, during the political season when so many people were like coming and going out of churches, the reason was not because of politics. The reason was because Christians were taking Jesus out of the conversation. And so you no longer were imaging Christ and you weren't imaging God. You're imaging the world around us. And that's why division happens. And so... Even in this, it's like, all right, it's causing problems within the church. But here's the other problem that it's causing. I mean, when you stop imaging God and imaging Jesus in the right way, how people see the church is also a problem. And so people that don't know Jesus or people who aren't connected to a church community are looking at Christians and being like, they're not saying, what the heaven are you doing? They're saying, what the hell are you doing? Because that's what you're representing. And so... We've got to like take this part in of who do we say Jesus actually is. There's this fascinating story in Matthew chapter 16. So if you aren't familiar with your Bible, um, uh, the Old Testament and New Testament, um, are, it's kind of how the Bible is broken up. And this hinge point is the life of Jesus, right? And it's kind of transitions into this New Testament. And uh, in this New Testament, the first four books are called the Gospels, which uh, essentially tell you like the life of Jesus. Well, Matthew was one of the writers, and uh, we're going to pick up this part of the story because I want you to see something that is, that is just fascinating because these cultural wars are nothing new. Um, like, and I'm not kidding you. Every cultural war we see right now, there is nothing new to it. I can point you to verse in scripture. It's the same thing, okay? And so um, we're going to see in Matthew chapter 16, something that Jesus does when he begins to talk about the church. Uh, you know, it's easy to kind of 
uh, be negative about the church, but I want you to see something about Jesus because uh, it's so important to understand about how we're supposed to view the church and how we're supposed to view our lives and what we're supposed to image as, as, as being like imaging the kingdom of God. And so in this story, a lot of people started following Jesus at, some point, at this point. Uh, his popularity is starting to grow a lot. And so um, people are starting to like talk about him and he's doing all these really cool things and he's on this journey that eventually leads to his death, all right? So we're gonna pick up this story in Matthew chapter 16. And it says this. When Jesus came to the region region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do do people say the Son of Man is? And so I want to focus on this part first, though. Caesarea Philippi. This is an interesting place in the world and in this story. So Caesarea Philippi um, was named this because Caesar gave his son Philip a city for his birthday. That's pretty cool, right? So whatever your best gift is, it wasn't a city, right? So... (laughs) So Caesar gives his son Philip um, this city. So it's called Caesarea Philippi. Now, before that, so I'm going to take you back. You, we're going to just nerd out together for a second, okay, um, around, around this. And you're going to see a larger point. So just bear with me. Way before, and I mean hundreds of years before, um, this, um, so Caesarea Philippi sits at the foot of Mount Hermon. And so uh, way before this, this area, which is like very rocky soil and everything, um, this area has this huge geyser that would fill the the river delta around it with water. But more importantly, uh, there was this uh, um, guy named Jeroboam who was a king, and he established this worship to this false god named Baal, okay? And so um, Baal, he uh, was known as um, the god of nature, um, and kind of the myth around this, this God was that he would die every year, okay? And that um, here's what would happen. And I'm not, what I'm about to say is not about being crude. It's just like, just the story. Um, he would die every single year and he's in charge of nature. And so whenever things would die, meaning like plants would die and everything, that meant, oh, Baal must have just died, all right? So he would go into the depths of Sheol, the underground. And then Baal would die, and then what happened is this, this woman named Asher, Asherah, this other goddess, would te- sexually tease him for this length of time, and then uh, tease him enough to ejaculation, and then welcome to church. And then when that happened, <laughs> when that happened, then it fertilized everything, and then things came back to life. And then Baal would come back through, all right? So this is what people thought, and they would worship him. They'd be like, oh, the God of nature and the the God of, you know, even fertility and everything. The God that made things come back to life. Fast forward a little bit as time goes on, and the Greco-Roman culture takes over. They take on um, this Baal, like, myth, but they give it to this new God named Pan, all right, and so this, this new God named Pan kind of comes into the picture, and, and here's what Pan looked like. He was um, half man and half goat, all right? And so they would have statues of Pan uh, everywhere. And they would talk about how Pan uh, was the god of nature, the same kind of rhythm. He would die every year. He would go and he would live with all the nymphs. And like, he was about sexual fertility. Um, uh, He was incredibly immature. Uh, He uh, would die every year. Um, And then he he was responsible for nature. He was uh, in charge of all the shepherds and their flocks. And so that the shepherds would know the voice of Pan, okay? So for those of you that know your Bible, when you talk about the good shepherd, it's actually, it's a shot at the God of Pan, okay? So when you start thinking about um, the Pan, so it's like, all right, so he was being in control of the good shepherd and uh, all the flocks. And so Pan would, uh, uh, they would tell his story about, so the word panic we get from the God of Pan. Because in this story in Greek mythology, um, upon this battle, uh, he let out this loud shriek that freaked, every, that freaked the enemies out and they had an irrational behavior. So that's where we get panic from. Well, in Greco-Roman culture, what ended up happening, they would start worshiping this God of Pan. And so um, in this, let me show you this too. So here's what they believed Right here, now we've been here, this is actually in Israel, uh, uh, our team has actually been here and did, actually did a devotional on this site. But here's what they would believe, that Pan would go in and see that large hole, um, they believe that that was the gates of hell, the gates of, ha- of Hades, that's how they would describe it. And that through that portal is where Sheol was, and through that portal is where all the spirits and all the gods lived. All right, and so they would release these things out of, out of this portal. And, um, and so, so they would think, all right, that's where Pan would go and that's where they would reside and all this stuff. So what would happen is um, every year, 
in, in Philippi, they would have this um, festival called Pandemonium. Now, I didn't show some of the pictures that I could have showed on this one, and you'll understand why in a second. But roughly, a half a million to a million people would come to Pandemonium every single year for this massive orgy. And what they would do in this moment is they would, they would worship the god Pan, and they would understand that this is about sexual fertility, and they would want the land to, to be like fruitful. They would want the land to, to bring forth everything that it would, it would have. And so, so women would come, they would have sex with, with other women, they would have sex with any man possible. The men would have sex with all the women, um, with sex with men, and they would have sex with goats because he was half man and half goat. All right? And so here's what else they would do. Then in order to please the gods, um, they would make these human sacrifices, often children, sacrifice them for favor of gods. And what would happen is, is through this, you can't really see this part, but below that, that portal there um, would be like the water would run out into this little pool, and then the blood that would come in from the human sacrifices would be spilled out into there. It would overflow over this rock and everything out. And they would say, this is how we please the gods. They just had no kind of they didn't see people as any dignity of life. Now, why does all of that matter? You're going to see here in just a second. Because this is where Jesus is teaching. This is where he's standing. This is where, he, you, where you're about to hear him say, and how he talks about the church, that he's doing it on this spot where pandemonium happens. On this spot where they believe the gates of hell actually really are. On this spot where, where everything that shapes that entire community around, around sex, around money, around politics, around greed, around power, everything, everything that shapes it was like consumed and kind of like would, would come to a pinnacle on this spot where Pan was. Side note, um, where do you think Peter Pan gets his name from? So maybe rethink that for a second. Verse 14. Told you, I need to get something off my chest. Verse 14, <laughs> he says this. So they replied, Jesus, like, who, who do people say that I am? And so people, so these, his disciples that were following him say this. Some say you're John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah, others say you're Jeremiah. So here's what's interesting about that. You might view Jesus in one kind of way. You might be like, oh, he was pretty chill, right? But how they actually really describe Jesus is his personality was kind of big, like, he had a big personality, enough that people would think, like, ooh, are you fiery like Elijah? Or are you kind of, like, got a little hint of crazy like John the Baptist? You know? And so, that, like, they're, they're trying to, like, you see, and then Jeremiah was kind of a, he, he was an interesting guy, but, but you see, like, oh, so his, so his personality wasn't just this docile, like, like, super calm all the time and, like, didn't really, like, get into it with people, whatever. But, like, Jesus had some personality to him, okay? And so, it's like, who are you? In verse 15, he says, but what about you, he asked. Jesus is saying this. Like, what, what are you, my followers, my followers, you, you, you're supposed to be with me. Who do you say I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter, look what he says. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So in verse 16, the word for Messiah there is Christ. All right, so um, you, know, you might hear the phrase Jesus Christ. That's not his last name. Um, sometimes people actually, you know, think that. Um, it's like, oh yeah, Jesus Christ. Like, no. It's Jesus the Christ. All right, so Jesus the Messiah. So the word for Christ there is about Messiah. It's about a Savior. Um, it's meant to signify uh, the anointed king, the anointed person that was supposed to come. Even when they talk about the son of the living God, that's not a phrase that's used very often. And so what Peter is actually saying here is actually kind of fascinating um, Peter is saying something that he fully doesn't even understand yet. That there's this essence to who Jesus is that's so different. And he's like, you're, you're the son of the living God. There's something different about you that we've never seen before, that has never been exemplified in anyone else. There's, there's something different about who you are. You're the son of the living God. And then in verse 17, it says this, so Jesus replies, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Judah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So he's like, the fact that you just said I'm the son of the living God, that doesn't come from just kind of human reasoning and knowledge. It, it was given to you by, by the Spirit of God. And I tell you that, that you are Peter. So let me pause here. 
what's Peter's real first name? Simon, Simon all right? So Peter isn't, isn't actually a name. It's a noun. So, so, so eventually he becomes called Peter, but it's more like a nickname, okay? So his name is actually still Simon. It's actually Simon Peter. They give him two names, but it's, it's, it's Simon the Rock. So he was the first rock, not Dwayne Johnson. So, so Simon, so Simon gets this, this name from Jesus. He's like, I'm going to call you the rock. Now, why is he going to call him the rock? Like, that's interesting. Like, well, as we'll eventually learn about Peter, he becomes one of the fathers of the church in the original early church movement. And he was known for his courage. He was known to be able to withstand um, some of the worst kinds of persecution. He was known to be able to stand up for the right things at the right times. So he says, and on this rock, I will, I, look at this. I will build my church. So who builds the church? Say it loud. Who builds the church? Yeah. We don't build the church. When it's, when it's the real church, we can build a crowd. We can gather people. But Jesus builds the church. So the church is never about us. Like, even for Lacey and I leading this church, it ain't about us or anyone on the staff. It ain't about us. Church is not about you. Jesus builds the church. And so everything is about making whose name great? Jesus. So Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome. Some translations say the gates of hell. So, so I want you to picture that. At that moment, here's what Jesus is doing. He's standing in this place that we talked about with all this background, with the portal in his, like, right behind him. And the disciples know what he's doing. He's like, and that will never prevail. Ever. The things that people are putting their hope in will never prevail. You know all these cultural wars that we're fighting right now? And I'm talking about back then, 2,000 years ago, around sexuality, around politics, around greed, around um, uh, the issues with male domination, all those things, around race, all those things of hell we experience and people are like putting everything into this whole thing about like worldly wisdom and, and earthly wisdom and, and, and all it does is bring hell. He's like, it will not prevail. It will not prevail. In verse 18 or verse 19, he continues, says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So get this. Uh, is Rome still around? The city is. Is the empire? Is Pan still around? The Caesarea Philippi, a thriving city still. Nope. Is the church still around? Man, who was right? <laughs> someday, someday, people will be like, what was America? Someday, people aren't going to give a rip about the president. Someday, people are going to look at this empire that we currently live in and be like, huh, what an interesting place in history. And you know what they're going to care about? Who the Christians were, not who the president was. You know what they're going to care about? How the church acted and what they lived out, not what cultural war they won. And you know what will be still be standing hundreds of years from now? The church. See, there's something so significant to this about the church. You see, the church becomes a church when the church decides to say, I know who Jesus is and Jesus is actually the Messiah. That he's the Christ. He is the son of the living God. The church becomes a church and Jesus builds the church when people actually decide they actually want to follow him and not the culture around them. The church becomes a church when people decide, you are Jesus and I'm going to submit my life and surrender my life to you. 
I'm going to courageously do that. Now, did Peter get this 100% right? No. Literally, three verses from now, Jesus calls him Satan. <laughs> do you know why he called him Satan? It's because Peter was trying to dictate who Jesus was instead of allowing Jesus to tell him who he was. And let me tell you something, we all do that to Jesus. He then says, Jesus, let me give you the keys to the kingdom. If I gave you the keys to my house, here's what I would expect. I'd expect you to take care of it. I'd expect you to make sure it's clean. I'd expect you to be very hospitable into it. And I expect you to have authority over what's going on in it. So Jesus says this, to the people who say you're going to follow me, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. I'm giving you the keys to this church idea. Whose idea was the church? You better learn that. <laughs> because when, when people start banging on the church, and they're like, oh, I hate the church, and I want to do the church, da, 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 da. and there are reasons that people say those things, by the way, and very valid ones because the amount of hurt Christians have done to people. But when people are like, screw the church, here's what you're also saying, screw Jesus. I know that's harsh. And there's two, don't misunderstand what I'm saying either. I'm not belittling someone's experience and hurt and pain. I'm not saying that. That is a very real thing. But to throw out everything else is to throw out what Jesus says he wants to build up. And so we see he's given us this kingdom. Now, so Peter gets called Satan. Now, Peter eventually then becomes a leader of the church. Peter becomes incredibly uh, significant. Peter also denies Jesus at one point, too. And so we start seeing in this rhythm that's so important to understand what does it mean to actually follow Jesus. So why does all this stuff matter? I want to highlight just a few things. One, saying we are a Christian doesn't mean we actually are. We have set up in our culture, the ability to say that we're a Christian with literally the lowest commitment possible. With, with no sacrifice, with like, even one of the reasons we don't do like the hand raising thing, like, you know, I'm not even saying that's bad or that isn't real. But just saying you're a Christian, like, it doesn't mean that you are. You see, when people in the early church 2,000 years ago, when they said, I'm a follower of Jesus, they were willing to put their life on the line for it. They were willing to say, I will give up everything for this. I'm willing to die for this. I'm willing to walk into work tomorrow. And when I say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, they're willing to lose everything. No one back then, literally no one back then, said, I'm a Christian, and then just went on and lived with their life. There was this deep sense of conviction about uttering those very words. So just saying it doesn't actually mean that we are. So let me talk a little bit about faith. We talk about having a faith in Jesus. Faith isn't lacking logic or reasoning, all right? So... How many of you guys just lean more on the intellectual or like reasoning and logic side of things? That's okay. That's where I lean to, right? So sometimes um, we can also try and reason our way out of things, right? Yeah, but what about, but what about, what, what about, right? That, that's our weakness. But on the emotional side, and, and I'll get to this piece too, but we do have to think things through. Like, just because culture says something feels right or like, hey, this seems like it's the right thing to do doesn't mean that it is just because emotionally it feels that way. Like, you, you, logic and reason deeply matter in our faith. Um, faith isn't just about what we say. Um, just because we say we are doesn't mean that we are. Faith isn't being optimistic, though you will be more optimistic when you start following Jesus. You have more hope. But just because you're an optimistic person doesn't mean you have great faith. Um, faith isn't being spiritual but not religious. It's been a common phrase for about the last 10 years. Like, I'm spiritual but I'm not religious. Well, that's like you, you are, um, 
Folks like that are crafting their own uh, spirituality for what they desire and what they want. And it's a low level of commitment. Um, faith isn't being 100% certain. If someone comes to you and they, as a Christian, they're 100% certain on everything, just walk away. <laughs> they're going to hurt you in some way. They're going to judge you in some way. And because no one in here should ever feel 100% certain about everything. Like, you're in process, you are uh, learning along the way. Um, doubt is a key part of developing your faith and developing a healthy faith. Deconstructing is, is a very healthy thing to do. And you do it with Jesus in hand, right? And in line um, with us. And let me just say this too. Um, I wrote this down. If someone can talk you into Jesus, someone else will talk you out of him. So, it's not just trying to be convinced into Jesus. Like, we've got to experience the fullness of Jesus, and that's what develops your faith. And so even for those that are like, you can be so judgmental. Everyone in this room is in process. Everyone. Every single person is in process. And I'm going to prove it to you by this question. What part of yourself are you afraid to look at in God's presence? So I heard this question um, a couple weeks ago. And I just like sat with it. And it's just how you, this should automatically make us more humble and gracious. That in God's presence, every single person in this room is going to have a little bit of like, oh, he can see that. Oh, he knows that. Don't look at me there. And so it means we're all in process. And so in this kind of we start thinking about doubt and all this stuff. It's like, man, the church, <laughs> the church should be the safest place for people to doubt. The church should be the safest place for people to be in process. Like, it just should be. That's a responsibility that we have when we're really following Jesus. Let me add this to us. Faith isn't an emotion. It's emotional, but it isn't just based on an emotion. And so, here's what faith is. You ready? Faith is a proclamation. We do say it. It's a promise. It's a covenant that we make together with God. It's a purpose. Like, I live my life and all that I do around it. And it's a committed action. That's what faith is. It's all of those things. Together, working itself out in process, together, in community. That this is what we do. Yes, I proclaim it, but I'm telling you, like, it's a promise that I'm making. Through thick and thin, I'm with you, Jesus. It's in this covenant, in the same way you think about marriage, in that same kind of way. It's a purpose. I, I understand that my purpose in life is to image Jesus and what he taught. So when you go to work tomorrow, your purpose isn't to make money. Your purpose isn't to just lead people. Your purpose is to image Jesus. As you faithfully work as you faithfully live out your life. And it's a committed action. It means that we don't just sit idly by. Two more. We protect. We protect. So if we, if we're really into this whole church thing and this whole faith thing, then we protect his house. Like Under Armour commercials, right? It's like we, we protect this house. We protect the house of Jesus Oh, I'm sorry. Let me just say this about the protection. I'm going to... Every single culture war that's going on right now, primarily what we see in media, I'm not saying in personal conversation, primarily what we see in media, in whatever news channel you watch or whatever social media you use, um, Jesus is vacant from the conversation. And so Jesus teaches us not to try and win a cultural war, but to live in such a compelling way that it dismantles it. So it totally changes how we perceive some of these conversations and how we're supposed to interact with them. We can call things out about the church, but we never should try and tear it down. So call out all the sexual abuse stuff that's happened in the church. Yes. Call out the racism that the church has been involved in over the years. Yes. Call out the political nightmare that has been within the church on the conservative and liberal side. 
in particular the last decade, but over decades, yes. And we can work through all the stuff. But do not try and tear the church down. That's not what we do. You call it out with the what? The idea that you want Jesus to build it back up, to build his church from the ground up and build it up. But that's what we do. So with that in mind, be suspicious of people who aren't committed to a community of believers. So the people you follow on social media or the people that are kind of speaking to you or the people you, goodness, people on freaking news channels. The, the, what they're putting out there, if they aren't committed to a grouping of fellow followers of Jesus as a church, I don't care if that's small, medium, big, whatever, then be very suspicious of what they're doing and what they're saying. They may say some things that sound correct, and they, listen, occasionally might even be correct here and there, but at the end, they don't want to build his church. They want to build their own kingdom. And so be very suspicious of people who aren't talking about who, what believers are actually commuted, uh, committed to. Be suspicious of narratives that go against what Jesus taught. Um, I, one of the things that I've been watching people do recently is um, saying like, oh, just stop praying about it. I'm like, if you eliminate prayer from this conversation, you're eliminating prayer from a huge part of what the Bible talks about. There's something powerful in prayer. So whatever the stuff is going on, it's like, no, prayer is a piece of this. So to try and ignore the reality of what prayer can do is to ignore the reality of what Jesus taught. Be very suspicious of narratives like that. However, be also suspicious of people who only want to pray. Because committed action is part of actually having faith, which, which is also something that Jesus taught. Um, beware of people and suspicious of people who um, say things like, we need to stop being kind and fight. We need to flip tables like Jesus did. Did Jesus flip a table? Do you know why he flipped the table? He wanted to prove a point to bring people back together to love him more and build this church. Some people talk about flipping tables just to be a jerk or just to prove a point. Be suspicious of folks like that. Be suspicious of people who ever say things like loving our enemies is weak. Or be suspicious of people who say we need to be partisan unless they're saying we need to be partisan to the kingdom of God and that alone. Be suspicious of people who don't appreciate nuance. Jesus fully embraced nuance. Um, and then be suspicious of anyone who ignores historical Christianity. Um, it's so easy to have chronological snobbery. Like, as we're so much smarter now. Um, if we're so much smarter now, why are we dealing with the same problems that Jesus taught about 2,000 years ago? So, be very suspicious of people like that. And let me just say this to end. We're part of a larger story. Part of a larger story. I love, um, Peter ends up writing this letter uh, later on to a bunch of Christians who have been going through a lot of different stuff and a lot of persecution, a lot of hurt. And, and look what the language he uses. He says, as you come to him, the living stone, meaning that, that, that Jesus is the foundational rock, right? To build the foundation off of. Rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, you're like living stones and are being built into a spiritual house. Holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. You've been called into building his kingdom. You've been called into, listen, this is collectively and personally. God wants to build us up from the ground up of the very being. And through us, he wants to build his church. Through us, he wants to do something that, that people get to see the kingdom of God. And then we begin to image who God is. Now listen, I, um, I love this church. I love our church. I love the church, and I love our church. Um, Lacey and I love leading this church. Like, we can't imagine doing anything else, and I can't imagine ever doing anything else. Like, it would literally have to take the voice of God from the high heavens to say something, to ever make me want to do something else. But I also, and, and listen, we, there's a lot of good that have co has come out of our church. But there's this unbelievable opportunity, and I just want you to feel the tension in this. That's what today was about. The responsibility of what it means to follow Jesus. 
the responsibility to engage. When Jesus says, I'm going to build this church, he's like, I'm going to build this church on the very rock that I'm standing on right now. He doesn't say, let's go build this church in like the really nice area of Jerusalem where it's like kind of easy and comfortable. He's like, no, I want to go into the thick of where all the hell is. I'm going to build my church on top of it because guess what? It will not prevail. And then what he's looking for is for the people who actually want to follow him so that he can build his church. And then others can see what the kingdom of God is actually like. That is our challenge, and that is our responsibility. So will you bow your heads? We're going to sing one more song together, but I just want you to process what God might be speaking into your heart today around commitment or whatever it is, anything that's holding you back from following him. So God, this morning, um, I believe that you want to build your church. I trust (laughs) that we can look at all this junk that's around us. We don't remove ourselves from it, but you build your church on it. And then as we follow you, When it comes to all these conversations around poverty, around racism, around politics and sexuality and even just practical things like work and marriage and friendship and dating and money, emotional health, physical health, it's like all the hell that we see in that. It's like if we just actually follow you like you've taught us to follow you, you're going to build your church on top of that and none of that stuff will prevail. And that your people are supposed to be involved. Your church is supposed to be influential in dismantling all this stuff. And God, that is what you've called your church to be. And so God, I don't want Hill City to be a church. I want us to be your church. And that you build it. We follow. We do what we're supposed to. But you build it. You influence your name, your credit, your glory. But it starts with people who actually want to follow you in the right way. We give this to you in your name we pray. Amen. Will you stand and sing this last song?